And if I'm going too slow, please let me know and I will slow down. On my first visit to Jamaica, I saw a pig's severed head. My grandmother's sister, auntie, had asked me to grab two bottles of ting from the icebox. And when I walked into the kitchen, pulled up the icebox lid, there it was. It's blood splattered and frozen thick on the bottles beneath. It's brown tongue lolling out from between its clenched teeth. The tip making a small dip in the ice water. My cousins were in the next room, so I clamped my palm over my mouth to keep from screaming. They were all my age and younger. During the five days I've already been in Hanover, they'd all spoken easily about the chickens they strangled for soup, and they'd idly thrown stones at alligators for sport, side-eyeing me when I was too afraid to join in. I want to avoid a repeat of those looks, so I bit down on my finger to push the scream back down my throat. Only two days before, I'd squealed when Rodney, who was ten like me, had wrung a chicken's neck without warning. The jerk of his hands and the quick snap of the bone had made me fall back against the coops behind me. He turned to me after I'd silenced myself and his mouth and nose were twisted up as if he was deciding whether he was ir irritated with me or contemptuous or just amused. Ah, uh, what? He asked. You not cook soup in Canada? Sure we do, I said, my voice a mumble. The chicken is just dead first. He didn't respond, and he didn't say anything about it in front of our other cousins. But soon after, they all treated me with a new found delicacy. When the girls played dandy shandy with their friends, they stopped uh, asking me to be in the middle. And when all of them climbed trees to pluck ripe mangoes, they no longer hung loose-limbed from the branches and tried to convince me to clamber up and join them. For the first three days of my visit, they'd at least tease me. Broad smiles clenching their cheeks and yell down, This tree frighten ya? Like, like how duppy frighten ya? Then they'd let leaves fall from their hands onto my hair and laugh when I tried to pick them out of my plates. I'd fuss and grumble. Picked at the taunting but grateful uh, at the taunting but grateful for the inclusion for being thought tough enough to handle the same mockery they inflicted on each other but after the chicken they didn't goad me anymore and they only approached me for games like tag for games they thought canadian girls couldn't uh, sorry could stomach what's taking you so long my mother came up behind behind me and instead of waiting for me to answer leaned forward and peered into the ice box swallowing hard as she did great she whispered are you going to be traumatized by this i didn't quite know what she meant but i felt like the right answer was no so i shook my head my mother was like my cousins i hadn't seen her butcher any animals but back home she stepped on spiders without flinching and she cussed out men who tried to reach her in the street. And I couldn't bear scoffing at me. And I couldn't bear her scoffing at me for screaming at a pig's head. Eloise! Nana called. My grandmother came into the kitchen from the backyard and stood next to us. Her hands on her hips. The deep arch in her back made her breasts and belly protrude. And the way she stood with her legs apart reminded me of a pigeon. I hear auntie call out she want a drink from the fridge. That there is a freezer, you know, want that? You know what Breda put in there? Kara can I see that. She na raise up for it. I closed the lid, said my mother. Anyway, it was a pig's head. It's not like she saw the pig get slaughtered. She's fine. Kara's a soft one. She can handle these things. I felt my mother take a deep breath in, and I suddenly became aware of all the exposed knives in the kitchen. 
and wondered if there was any way I could hide them without being noticed. We were only here for 10 days, and my mother and Nana had already gotten into two fights, one in the airport and on the day we landed, the other two nights after. And Auntie had threatened to set the dogs on them if they didn't calm down. Me thought Canada was supposed was supposed to be a civilized place. How you two fight like dogs, them, cha? I wondered if all the daughters found with their mothers this this way when they'd grown up. And I started to tear up just thinking about it. Nana looked at me. See? She a cry about the head. It's not about the head, my mother said. She just cries over anything. Like I say, she a soft child. The pig's head haunted me for the rest of the trip. When we did things the tourists did, like try to climb up the Duns River Falls, I'd imagined the head waiting for me at the top of the rocks. The blue-white water pouring out of its snout and ears and at Auntie's house, it was haunting. I was haunted by its disappearance and legacy. Nana kept me away from the kitchen and either icebox. Her normally pinched up face was smooth with concern, which irritated me more than I, than it comforted me. But back home in Toronto, I told everyone about the head. At school during recess, I gathered all my classmates around in the playground and watched as their pink faces flushed red with vicarious thrill. And you killed the pig, they gasped. You weren't scared? You weren't grossed out? Nope, I said without hesitation. It was cool. Was there lots of blood? Tons, I giggled and leaned in so everyone around me could make the circle tighter. I was the one who stuck it in the throat and the blood just came gushing out. Ew, they sang out, covering their faces, cowering from the image of spurting blood, dark and thick and um, and a slashed throat. They spread their hands out so they could see me through the spaces between their fingers. Did any of the blood get on you? Yeah, that part was pretty bad. The words came naturally. And with every sentence, I could see the images of my story unfold before me like they were pieces of a memory I'd forgotten. I told many stories at school. Stories that made me the subject of interest, stories that took on lives of their own and allowed me to build different identities, personalities, stories that brought me audiences. The only person who wasn't all that excited about the pig's head was Anna May, a girl one grade above us who always had her blonde hair twisted into French braids. She just moved to the city from a farm in Capa... Capascassing, somewhere in Northern Ontario, and she'd already told us about the blind or sickly kittens they would drown in the river there. For the first couple of months, she was known as the girl who killed cats, and whenever she showed up at birthday parties, the birthday boy or girl having been guilted into inviting her by his or her parents. If there was a cat in the house, all the kids would take turns holding it tightly to their chests, or someone would lock it away in the basement for safety. Always keeping an eye on Anna Mae and what she doing and where she was going. But away from school in the neighborhood where we lived, the kids were skeptical, uh, sorry, skeptical of my story as Anna Mae was unenthused, staring blankly at me as she had. Most of my neighborhood friends had either just moved here from the islands or had visited them so often it was like they lived both here and there. And so none of them found anything intriguing about my story, not even the kids who came from the island cities and not the farms. I wasn't foolish enough to tell them I'd stuck the pig, though. If I knew I pushed it too far they'd find me out, and their trust would be much harder to win uh, 
win back than that of the white kids at school. So what did you do then? We were at Jordan's apartment in her bedroom, sucking the jumbo-sized freezies and deciding which CD to play in the Sony stereo, Rule 336 or the Marshall Mathers LP. I was on the bed and lying on my back, my head dangling off the foot of the mattress, almost touching the floor, my eyes on the pink paint-chipped walls and the Destiny's Child and Alalia posters. I watched, I said. Rochelle was sitting at the study desk in the corner of the room, logged into a chat room, turned away from the computer and looked at me. Did you close your eyes? No. I saw the whole thing. And you weren't scared, said Jordan, inching closer to where I was lying down. Nope. Yeah, right. It's true. And when it was dead, I cut a piece off. Aishani laughed. Did not. Did too. Norris helped me so I wouldn't mess up. You didn't tell us about a cousin named Norris. Norris works for auntie and brother. Anita yawned, then put her hands behind her head. I still don't believe you weren't scared, she said. You can't even jump from the top of the stairs to the bottom like we do. Well, I wasn't scared of this. I'm going to ask your mother uh, when she comes, she said. Go ahead. She'll tell you I didn't scream. Anita's mom picked her up before mine did, and I no longer had to fret so much about the possibility of exposure. I knew the other girls were less likely to press it. By the time my mother, my own mother came for me, their insults didn't have such a mean bite. They didn't feel like they were meant for an outsider. There was a subtle warmth of good nature now for the kind of inclusion I've had and lost with my cousins. My mother passed her tired eyes over me in the passenger seat. Even at 10, my feet didn't touch the ground. Had a good time at Jordan's? It was fun, I said. I want to go more, if that's okay. Maybe. We had to stop for gas before going home. A wood-paneled boat of a machine. My mother's station wagon always seemed in need of gas and plagued us with new worries instead of simply ridding us of our old ones. I remembered her face when she first saw the car, how her nose wrinkled in disgust, but the woman who was selling it knocked the price down to a number my mother couldn't afford to say no to. She stuck me in the line to pay while she went to the fridges for some milk, promising me a chocolate bar when we reached the cashier. The woman in front of me took her receipt from the cashier and headed out to her pump, and then a man cut in front of me. Excuse me, said my mother. She walked from the back of the store to the counter, a slim box of 2% in her hand. You just cut in front of my daughter. Oh, the man said. Oh, my mother repeated. She was next in line. Go to the back. Jesus Christ, said the man. He was beefy and mean looking. Buzzed blonde hair, a red skull and bones. T-shirt stretched over his chest. I wanted to tell my mother to leave him alone. I could have paid for the, ga I could have paid for the gas in the amount of time you stood here bitching at me, he said. What's your fucking problem? Oh, some language. That you didn't wait your turn. Get to the back of the goddamn line. Mummy, I tugged on her jacket, but she slapped my hand away and I recoiled from the sting. The cashier started to raise his hands in a plea for my mother and the man to calm down. And nervousness shivered through the line. The people behind us started to fidget. I don't like this, I whispered. I don't like this. I don't like this. The man headed out of the store, pushing open the door so that it thumped against the outer wall. Always something with you fucking people. My mother slammed the milk down on the counter and yelled um, the pump number to the cashier. She turned to me. Why were you going to tell me to stop? I just didn't want to... What? Want to what, Kara? I started to chew on my lower lip and hoped that by some miracle 
the floor would open up and swallow me whole and cushion me from her voice. I wanted to forget about it. Of course, you want to forget everything. I don't know how you got to be so soft. Everyone will walk all over you if you just forget it. Come on, let's go. My mother banged out of the store without bothering to get a receipt, and I gave the cashier a small, apologetic smile before following her to the car. After about a week, my teachers got wind of the pig's head, probably because its severance became a bloodier and more gruesome with every telling. My mother's warning about being soft bounced around in, about being soft bounced around in my head, and soon I started adding new embellishments to the story. Have you ever ever heard a pig a pig scream? I'd ask, and after seeing a bunch of brown-haired heads wag from side to side, I'd shudder. It's really bad, I'm telling you. Every recess during stolen moments in class, I'd report a new detail to my adoring audience. How the pig, being so strong and fat, gave us such a hard time when we grabbed it in its pen that Norris had to bash its head in with a hammer before I cut in with the knife. How I wasn't wearing any gloves, so the blood poured warm and thick and sticky onto my hands. And then after school, when I finished my homework, and I made my way down to the 7-Eleven with Rochelle and the rest of the girls, and sometimes even the boys from our block. I'd saunter down the sidewalk and sip my Slurpee and say, even when they skinned it, I didn't look away, not once. Quickly, I became one of the most popular kids in my grade. I was up there with Savannah Evans and Nicholas Lombardi. Savannah was the richest kid in school. Nick, with his long eyelashes and dirty blonde cherub curls, was the cutest. And I was suddenly the craziest. Older sisters brought their younger siblings to me to be frightened and amazed. And in the playground, boys started inviting me to play red ass with them, whipping me with a tennis ball as hard as they whipped each other. Popularity did not claim me in the neighborhood like it did at school, but there, nothing felt the need to translate for me anymore. To always bring up the great misfortune of being Canadian born. I got bored of the live pig of describing how boldly I'd watched it slaughter, and I moved on to explaining how I'd helped Auntie prepare jerk pork out of the butchered body. After that, whoever I hung out with mentioned fruits like skin up without asking me if I knew what they were, not asking me if I knew what the Jamaican name of them gin up was. Um, and they yelled, Wagwan! when they saw me instead of oh hey for a week i blustered around school and swaggered down marley avenue and silently waited for the attention i got to transform me into a girl who would actually have the moxie to slaughter a pig but that courage never burned in my belly that aggression never revealed itself in a disregard for rules or a penchant for pranks like it did with my friends my sense of boldness only lasted for as long as my description of the pig did. I didn't know that the teachers had found out about my stories until a Monday afternoon when I saw my mother standing in the hallway just before final recess. We all queued up to leave and when Miss Kakos, the student teacher, opened the classroom door to let us out, I saw my mother leaning against the plastered wall a chew tip pencil jutting through her messy ponytail of relaxed hair, her tattered knapsack by her feet. The sight of her made my fingers quiver. She had no place for my stories. She didn't belong with any of the identities I constructed during the time I spent at school. Miss Kakos 
shepherded the kids to the yard, and Miss Gold put her hand on my back and beckoned for my mother to come inside. I was in a split-grade class, so my classroom wasn't one of the largest in school, divided into sections. Reading section, working section, science section, uh, cleansing section. I'd heard my mother uh, whisper to her other mother friends about schools that had walls and ceilings falling apart, about schools that packed children into portables because of the lack of space. But my school wasn't like that. Every room was big and colorful and chock full of brand new equipment the school fundraised for. My classmates were picked up in Range Rovers and BMWs, driven by their nannies and occasionally their parents. Sometimes the parents would stop my mother and offer her a job. I'm picking up my own child, she'd say before walking away. I'd be happy next to her, tugging on her sleeve. Why? I'd be right next to her, tugging on her sleeve. Why did Katie's mom uh, ask if you needed a job when you have one? Stop talking, Kara, she'd whispered back, her face tight. Miss Gold led us to the corrective section when she was really just, uh, which was really just her desk. She sat down be behind it and gestured for my mother to, uh, and me to sit in the two blue stack chairs on the other side. I'm just going to get right to the point, Mrs. I'm sorry, Miss Davis, said Miss Gold, folding her hands together. There has been a rumor around the school, uh, started by Kara, uh, that she killed a pig on, a on your vacation to Jamaica. The children have been abuzz with it. It seems to be quite the playground story. You called me down here because my daughter told you a lie? Sorry, told a lie? So the story isn't true? No, said my mother. But even if it were, a child witnessing or helping out with butchering isn't unusual or uncommon in Jamaica. But no, my daughter didn't participate in either activity. Miss Davis, to be frank, whether or not the story is true or irrelevant, it's the nature of the lie that's concerning. My mother looked at me but I lowered my head so as not to meet her stare. I went over the story in my mind. The blood, the knife, the hammer, the screams. It no longer came to me in images. Now it just seemed like words that didn't belong to me. From what Miss Kakos, Mr. Roberts, the gym teacher, and I have gathered, Kara has exhibited pleasure and enthusiasm toward the concept of slaughtering an animal. Well, children enthusiastically step on worms, rip the legs off daddy long legs, squish bees. Kids are intrigued by the concept of death. I understand that this is a delicate topic, and I am not hurrying to any conclusions. However, perhaps it would be good for Kara to see the school's child psychologist. Let me stop you right there, said my mother, raising her hand. She paused for a beat and then smiled uh, the way I'd seen her do sometimes when a cashier or a waiter or our landlord got on her nerves. Miss Gold, did you also know that I'm quite familiar with education protocol, she said? And I believe that for a situation like this, the protocol is that before prescribing the school psychologist, the teacher must give the parent the option to take the child to a family doctor who would then offer their own referral. Miss Gold pressed her lips together, a flush of red coloring, of red coloring her neck. When my mother finished speaking, she cleared her throat. I ultimately don't believe that the situation is all that serious, she said. I just thought you should know. Thank you for your concern and rest assured it will be dealt with. If you don't mind, said my mother, standing up. I got up with her. I would like to take Kara home now. In the car, my mother turned to me. Her finger pointed in my face. Do you realize what you've done? Mom, I'm speaking. She snapped her fingers loudly, and I flinched. These people already look at me like I'm trash, Kara. I opened my mouth to speak, even though I had no idea what to say to her. But she just shook her head and turned away from me, resting back against her seat. 
I do not need you making things worse by lying. Why would you even say that you killed a pig? I stayed silent, hunched in my seat. My eyes uh, wandered as if scouting out an, an exit strategy, though I knew I could never just open the door and walk away from her. My mother banged her palm against the steering wheel. I asked you a question. I don't know why I did it, I said. I'm sorry. You're a little liar. If you were sorry, you'd just stop making up stories, she said. I don't know what I did to make you this way. Did you tell anyone from the neighborhood? I squeezed my index and middle fingers with my left hand. Just that I saw it, but nobody cares there. Uh, and you said that in Jamaica. That isn't the point, she said. I'm dropping you off at Nana's. She's off work today. I need to go back to the library, and I just can't deal with you right now. We only, we only live one street from here. If anything happens, I can call her and she can come over. Please don't make me go there. You not wanting to go to Nana's just makes me want to leave you there even more. Put on your seatbelt. Before my mother dropped me off at Nana's door, she instructed me to tell my grand, uh, grandmother what I'd said about the pig's head. And I'll tell you, and I'll know if you don't, she said. Telling Nana what I'd told my friends and the kids at school was easy. It wasn't what came after that made me run to the guest room and collapse on the bed. My face buried in one of the floral pillows that had been placed perfectly against the headboard. The door was closed, but I could hear my grandmother calling all the right people in the neighborhood to tell them about what I've done. She a bright eyed little pickney, she said to Rochelle's great aunt. I tell her, say, you make your sail too big for your boat. Your sail will capsize you. She always make up story them for when she was small. No way her mother let her slice up a pig. My daughter not crazy. Of course, my friend's mothers uh, told them all about it. And of course, none of them uh, was surprised. And when I ran into the group on my way to the 7-Eleven, they acted as much. Hey, Kara asked Jordan, sucking on a rocket popsicle. We were going to see if we could get into the school and run up to the roof, said Rochelle. Want to come? I'm okay, thanks. And I told you she'd say no, Shell, said Anita, smirking as she walked past me, knocking her shoulder into mine. She's too scared. After my mother's visit, I'd been afraid that Miss Gold would tell the class I'd been lying. But two days later, I was still being asked about Hanover. I ended up repeating details rather than adding new ones, forgetting to lean in close at certain points and yell at others, not bothering to whisper, to inspire shivers, or to widen my eyes to elicit gasps. At recess, I leaned against the trunk of the great willow tree that sprouted from the patch of dirt dug into the pavement watching some boys play cops and robbers while a group of girls played mailman mailman their hands stretched painfully wide in near splits after a few minutes i saw anna may walking um, up to me her french braids tied together with a lavender ribbon that crisscrossed in and out she leaned next to me i never see you alone she said her voice was softer than I expected. Too soft for a kitten killer. Just feel like sitting out. You're standing. Yeah, I said. Yeah, she said. We stood together for a while in silence that I found unusual, but not uncomfortable. It even felt peaceful. It was the silence that gave me the opportunity to settle um, into myself to hear myself breathe and think. I looked at Anna Mae in her purple corduroy overalls and noticed for the first time uh, that her skin was a soft, 
that her skin was a soft... Sorry, I lost my place, guys. That her skin was a sort of grayish cream that her eyes... Uh, and, and that her eyes were green. She pushed her hands deep into her pockets and slowly raised her head so that the back of it rested against the trunk and some of the bark chipped off into her hair. I felt no desire to think of a crazy anecdote for her to listen to. No need to twist myself into a new identity. I just felt like talking to her. It must have sucked watching kittens die. I was six the first time. I threw up, she said. I stood there and imagined what it would be like to watch a kitten barely bigger than a grown-up's hand get dunked and held underwater. I didn't do it, you know, I said. Kill a pig. I made it all up. She smiled. That's okay. Yeah? Yeah. The bell rang, and I could hear the collective groan of kids mid-game. They'd have to wait till lunchtime to pick up where they'd left off, and there'd no doubt be shouts for do-overs and clean slates. Anna Mae and I walked quietly together to the nearest school doors, sidestepping a tennis ball, rolling its way down to the fences, completely abandoned by the boys who'd, who'd been playing red ass ten minutes earlier. <laughs>